The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, why don't, why don't we go ahead and get started? All right. uh, so today what we want to do is, uh, is start thinking a bit about evolution in finite populations. And uh, of course, uh, what we mean by that is evolution in populations where, uh, where we have to really think about stochastic dynamics. And now, in general, uh, just like in the context of uh, gene networks within cells, uh, the, the situation where we have to worry about stochastic dynamics is, uh, is in the small number kind of limit. Okay. What's, uh, what's perhaps surprising about evolution is that, uh, that they're always, the small numbers are always important. Okay? Even if you're in a large population, right, say 10 to the 9 individuals, if you want to study evolution, then you're interested in cases where new mutants will arise in the population. And kind of uh, by definition, those new mutants start out uh, as kind of a single member of the population, right? which means that uh, then in the context of evolution, we always have to think about, um, about stochastic type dynamics. Okay. Now, the basic uh, model that we're going to use in this class is the Moran process, which is a, uh, a model that fixes population size. And then, uh, and then instead of having discrete uh, generations uh, where all the individuals are, uh, are reproducing at the same time, which is what you might have seen in this uh, Wright-Fisher process, instead we're going to think about the situation where uh, it occurs more uh, stepwise in the sense that individuals uh, reproduce one at a time, and then we, we can track the dynamics of the population. All right, so we're going to think about uh, both uh, the situation where we're trying to understand uh, neutral dynamics, when we're tracking the uh, composition of a population when uh, the, uh, the fitness of the individuals is equal or nearly equal. Right? Uh, but because of the stochastic dynamics, there are interesting things that happen. Uh, but then we'll get into this, uh, the question of non-neutral evolution. And, and really, we want to consider both halves of that. Right? So uh, in many cases, in the context of evolution, we're interested in or focused on, uh, on beneficial mutants. Now, uh, for those beneficial mutants, uh, one of the basic things we're going to find is that uh, even, uh, even beneficial mutants will typically go extinct. Okay? That doesn't mean that they're not important uh, over the long run, but uh, it does mean that uh, there is a very real sense that, that, uh, that randomness is dominating the life of even beneficial mutants. Okay? And then finally, if there's time, uh, we will discuss this idea of Muller's ratchet, which is uh, basically pointing out that if there are deleterious mutants or mutations in the population, uh, those uh, deleterious mutations can, in some cases, uh, spread and fix in the population. And when that happens, uh, you can have a decrease in the fitness of a population over time. Right? And this, uh, this is particularly uh, a strong effect for small populations, because small populations, uh, they're not as effective, uh, what you might call filters, for, uh, for selection. And so what we want to do is start by thinking about this Moran process. Okay, the key feature here is that we're going to have a constant population size, All right, constant n. All right. And that's not because we believe that pot real populations always have a fixed population size, but rather uh, we want to uh, try to get some intuition in this, uh, in this simple model. And then, of course, uh, it's reasonable to ask, well, you know, which, which uh, aspects of, of the mathematics or intuition that we develop are going are gonna to change as a result of allowing fluctuations in the total population size. But, um, but I think it's, there's a lot of value in, in starting out by, by analyzing the simplest model that you can. Okay. All right, so what we're going to think about is a situation where we have a uh, population composed of n individuals. And for now, we'll just consider two types, A and B. And this is, uh, is going to be a model for, uh, for uh, asexually reproducing populations, constant n. Uh, asexual. Uh, right. What that means is, in particular, that we're going to assume that an A individual can uh, lead to two A individuals. Similarly, a B individual can lead to two B individuals. Okay. Right. So you can think about this as, for example, uh, a model for how microbial populations uh, may evolve. Okay. Uh, and for now, uh, we will not consider any uh, any mutations. All right. So we're going to Think about the process of assume that those mutations are already there. So A and B could be uh, different. They could have, for example, different 
Uh, they could be different at, at some uh, point mutation site on some gene that is relevant for growing on low glucose concentrations, for example. Okay. All right. So here we're going to. Okay. So this is um, birth slash division, and, and, and in particular here we're going to, for now, assume no mutation. All right. So we'll say, assume that A's always give birth to A's, and B's always give birth to B's. All right, well, we'll, um, we'll, we'll follow the nomenclature from, uh, from the reading that you guys did uh, last night, uh, Martin Novak's book, Chapter 6, all right, where we're going to um, think about, we're going to assume that uh, there are initially I, uh, A individuals, and therefore N minus I, uh, B individuals. Okay. All right. Now, we'll assume that. Uh, the, the, basic, the basic process for the man, uh, in this Moran process is that you, you have reproduction or birth that's proportional to fitness. And then the resulting kind of what you might call a daughter cell uh, replaces one member of the population at random. Right, so there's birth and then replacement. And indeed, we'll assume that replacement uh, that the daughter cell, for example, could even replace the mother, the mother cell if we want. Okay. So this is just the birth. So A is going to lead, there's going to be two A's, and this new A will have to replace one of the other individuals in the population to keep constant population size. Okay. All right. Are there any questions about the, the, the basic model here? OK. Um, so, all right, so that, that, in principle, here we can use this model to try to understand uh, both neutral and non-neutral evolution. But let's start out by thinking about the neutral case. Okay. So in particular, uh, the fitness, you know, Ra is equal to Rb. Okay. All right. Now, uh, what I want to do is, uh, given this, given the rules that we've just kind of laid out for you, let's assume that I over n is equal to uh, one third. Okay, so let's we'll say for now we'll say okay, a third of the population is A, uh, two thirds is then B. All right, and we uh, we can think about these these probabilities of going from I to I plus one as compared to going from I to I minus one. All right, so these are the probabilities that in one cycle of birth replacement, uh, the number of A's goes up one or goes down one. Right, can you ever go up two or three or four in the Moran process in one step? No. Right, I guess each step is always one birth and one replacement. Right, so you can move at most one. Do you always move? Does I change? Always? No. Okay. Right, what we want to know is the probability of going from I uh, to I plus one as compared to the probability of going from I to I minus one. So the ratio of these probabilities is equal to what? All right, so we're considering a case where the A's and B's have the same fitness, so they're um, somehow equal per capita probability of being chosen to reproduce, but there's, uh, but we're not in a symmetric population distribution, right? So one third of the population is A, two thirds is B. Okay. All right, so I'll give you 20 seconds to think about this. <coughs> All right, do you need more time? Everybody nod or shake. Do you need more time? OK. All right, I'll give you another 10 seconds, because it's, you know. All right, let's go ahead and see where we are. All right, ready? Three, two, one. All right.
we have um, actually a wide range of different answers here. OK, uh, perfect. This is, this is exactly the situation that we hope for. All right, so turn to a neighbor. You should certainly be able to find somebody that disagrees with you. All right, so if the first person you turn to agrees with you, uh, try to find somebody else to talk to. All right, why don't, why don't we uh, go ahead and reconvene? I, I know that uh, there was quite a lot of disagreement, so that means that you guys will probably not be able to converge in this uh, kind of one minute time frame. But um, let me just see, let me see if anybody, uh, anybody's mind was changed by their neighbors, all right? Uh, let's re vote. Ready? Three, two, one. OK. Um, all right, so it, it, it's pretty much the same as where we started, maybe. All right. Um, OK. Uh, I, I would say, yeah, anybody want to volunteer what their neighbor said? I, I, I know what your neighbor said. All right, so tell us. Um, OK, so, so, if you, if, um, so I would say it's D. And the reason is that so there are two cases. In the first case, the, the number A and B stays the same. right? Like, for example, A gets born and A dies. Mm -hmm. So you first decide, is the, pot, is the number of A and B going to change, or is it not going to change? Okay. Once you've decided that it's not going to change, I'm sorry, once you decide that it is going to change, right. um, then you just want to know, okay, then what's the probability that you just you choose A to change or what's the probability that you choose B to change? Okay. Um, yeah. And then the probability that A, you choose A okay. to the but, but you haven't said anything about replacement yet. So I'm, uh, a replacement should be, um, right, because certainly we're, we're talking about the ratio, the probability you, that, that the number of A goes up. As compared to the probably the number of A goes down, right? So in some right, so we've already in some ways excluded the cases where uh, the number of A individuals doesn't change, right? And, and in your what you just told us that you, you were asking about the probability that that individuals are going to be chosen uh, to reproduce. Uh, yeah, or just that one of the population. Okay. Yeah, no, but I, I guess all I'm, I'm saying is that there are going to be two halves to this, right? So that you have to think about the probability that an individual is being chosen to reproduce, and also the probability that uh, and a particular type of individual will be chosen to get replaced, right? So it's the it's some there's somehow a balance of those two, right? Because you know because in this case replace. replace this is death, right? Death yeah. slash yeah, right? Um, yeah. So and I, I should maybe just highlight if you want you could call it you know replacement. I mean this is just a nice way of saying death, right? Um, death. Um, um, the, the point is right. that once you once you rule out once you say okay the populations are going to change, then if okay. you choose an A to reproduce, a B has to die. But if, oh, okay. If once if you've if already if, um, if an A is chosen to reproduce and an A is chosen to die. Yeah. Then okay. Yeah. Um, right. But I, okay. I think that I understand what you're saying. But we then but you still have to keep track of, of there are the two sides. There's the replace. There's the the birth and the replacement. So we have to figure out kind of how you know the, the relative probabilities or rates that those two things happen. Right. Does somebody want to make an argument for something else? I mean, we'll, we'll see how this plays out in a moment. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I want to argue for C. OK. Um, so, so take the numerator. Yep. In order to go from i to i plus 1, so we're going to take two individuals from the population. We need one of them to be type A. That's the one that's going to reproduce. Yep. And the other to be type B, the one that's going to die. Yep. So we're, we get the product of those. Perfect. OK. And, and we can actually just be more be explicit about this. Okay. So the, the probability in one cycle, right? The probability that you go from i to i plus one, okay, that requires that two things happen. One is that you choose an a individual to reproduce, and what's the probability that you choose an a individual to reproduce? It's going to be i over 
i over n. Okay, so we have i over n, right? Okay, so this is um, this is the this is the you know this is the probability that a reproduces, okay. and then uh, for i to go from you know to, to increase by one requires not only that an a individual is chosen to reproduce, but that a b individual is chosen uh, to, for replacement or death. Okay, what's the what's the probability that that's going to happen? N minus i all over n. N minus i all over n. Okay. okay. All right, so this is the probability that in uh, one cycle you're going to go from i to i plus one. Okay. Now, um, of course, it's not. We haven't, you know, said what the probability of staying at i is, but this is the probability that i will increase by one. Do we agree? Right. And indeed, wh where, is it that we've where is it that we've assumed neutrality in this calculation? That A and B are, uh, are, have equal fitness. Yeah? Can you just take the probability of the individuals that's going to be about? That's right. That's right. So um, indeed, um, we've, we've, this probability that A reproduces, we've assumed that it's just simply I over N, whereas if it were non-neutral, we'd have to write something else. And maybe we'll figure out what that's going to be in a moment. But um, it's, it's in here that we've assumed that. Uh, incidentally, you could write down a reasonable model similar to the Moran process where uh, differences in fitness show up. Instead of here as, in the probability of reproduction, you could have it as a uh, difference in probability of, of death or, or uh, being replaced. But this is the most maybe intuitive way of thinking about it. Okay. All right. And this is very similar to, for example, what happens uh, in, a, uh, in a, uh, what you might call a, a turbidostat, where you keep constant population size. And as, as the cells divide, other uh, cells are randomly sucked out. Okay? So I'd say that this Moran process is really a uh, uh, theoretical uh, kind of implementation of what, what you could do experimentally is, is this turbidostat, which is like a chemostat. It's a, instead of keeping constant dilution rate, you fix population size. Okay? Yes? So do we care about like, the step of, OK, first A reproduces, then from the pool of new individuals, Okay. Well, okay. So I, 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 maybe I, well, I wasn't totally clear on this. Okay. So right. So you have n individuals here. Right. What you're going to do is you're going to choose one of them randomly. You know, maybe proportional to fitness for reproduction. And then, but then from this original n, you choose one of them for death. Okay. So you're not. Yeah. So it's not. So the the daughter cell is not allowed to. Die. Right. The daughter cell always replaces somebody, but it could have been the mother cell, if we're if we're thinking about this in, in the context of cells. All right, so we haven't yet figured out which answer is which, right? But, um, but we can go ahead. OK, this is a probability that A reproduces. And over here, this is the probability uh, that a B individual uh, is replaced, right? OK. But what we can do is we can ask, well, what's the probability that we go from i to i minus 1? Okay. Well, it's the exact kind of same calculation, except now what we want to know is the, we want to know the probability that a B is chosen for reproduction. And what is that going to be, somebody? N minus I, right, the number of B individuals divided by the total number of individuals. All right, so this is probability that a, that a B uh, reproduces. Okay, and then what's the probability that, a, that an A type individual will be chosen for replacement or death? That's just i over n, right? The number of a individuals divided by the total population size. Okay. All right. Does everybody agree with the the two calculations that we just did? All right. Let's let's revote. All right. Ready. Three, two, one. All right, see, so, you know, if we do the calculation, we can convince you. All right, okay, right. So indeed, this is this is uh, these are these are equal. These two probabilities. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right, and th this is funny because on the one hand, it's like blindingly obvious, but then the other hand, you get yourself all tied up in knots thinking about it. So I don't I, I don't understand why how those two statements can be true at the same time, but they are. Right. So it's it's. It, um, Right, so this is indeed uh, a random walk in, uh, in I space, 
number of A individuals. Okay? Uh, and all of the, and, and, and it sort of has to be because these things are neutral. The fact that I over N is not equal to a half doesn't matter because these two terms kind of cancel. But indeed, all of the things that you know have to be true based on the fact that A and B have equal fitness. Um, they're they're, they're going to um, not work if this thing were not equal to 1, right? If, the, if these two probabilities were not equal, right? So if you know, any of these other answers would lead to things that you would clearly agree are going to be nonsensical if you kind of think through the, um, the consequences of this. And we'll, we're going to do one right now. Okay. Um, All right, so let's imagine that we start. OK, so here's um, the number of A individuals, I. OK, I apologize that that's the nomenclature we have for <laughs> a number of A individuals, but you know, we want to be consistent with Martin's book. OK, now, um, OK, let's say this is N. And, uh, and let's say we start out at you know, this some i here. All right, the question is, what's the probability that b fixes? Okay, I want to make sure I write down some reasonable options. Um, so what we want to know is the probability that, um, that b fixes. And that means that it takes over eventually. Okay, That b, we'll say eventually. In the Moran process with neutral dynamics, I'm going to give you seven more seconds. All right, ready. Three, two, one. All right, so we have, uh, it's kind of mostly split between C's and D's. Although I'd say a majority of the group is going to say is saying that it's it's going to be D. I can say, all right, can uh, um, all right, and this is right the distinction between the probability that B fixes and that A fixes. Um, I'm not trying to be super tricky, but I just want to make sure that you got you keep track of A's and B's. Okay, um, and in particular, as I increases, the probability that A fixes should go up or down verbally three. Two, one, up, right? Okay. So this, this over here, over here is you know a bunch of A's. Here is a bunch of B's, right? So if you have a larger here, then you should be more likely to fix the A individuals, vice versa. Okay. Right. So in particular, this um, the probability that B eventually fixes is going to be this, whereas the probability uh, that A will fix eventually. Is just going to be one minus that is i over n. So this is this is indeed what um, what was pointed out in the book. Okay, All right. And, and can somebody uh, give an argument uh, verbally for why the? I think that this is a, a result that if you think about it in the right way, it, you know, you can just verbally say why it has to be this, um, rather than writing down all the equations that you know that. So why is it that the probability that A will eventually fix has to be equal to I over N? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> so, it's, okay, so, it's, uh, so at this 
given time, there are n individuals? Yep. And, um, and there will always be n individuals, because we're okay. keeping it. Yep. Okay, yeah, right. um, so um, their descendants, at some point, the descendants of, of one of them is going to take over the whole population. That's a given. That's right. Right. You know, you know, and, and that's a, it's at first glance kind of surprising, but you know, it's just the nature of uh, you know, it, I, you know, if you imagine that they all were individually tagged, right? So it wasn't just that we had two types A and B, but if they were all color coded using the rainbow colors, then you could keep track of them, and um, and one of the individuals will eventually fix, right? Now, um, okay, and then what? What next? Okay, and then there, there was one ingredient in that argument that you didn't say, but I'm sure is in your mind, which is how is it that the probability, so uh, among these n individuals, okay. right, um, you know, one of them will eventually fix, and, um, and, and, and what's the probability that each one will be the lucky, dis, you know, ancestor for all of the population? Yeah, it's just one over n, right? So the idea is there are n individuals in the population, they're all identical. Right? We know that eventually one of them is going to take over the population just due to random stochastic dynamics. Well, what that means is that each individual has a probability of 1 over n of taking over the population. Okay, this is very important. Okay, so um, each individual has, uh, has a 1 over n probability of, um, of fixing. And that's, that's assuming that, that every, everybody in the population has the same fitness. Right? And that's just by, by symmetry. Right? Okay. But then, of course, you can all say, well, you know, if the probability of each individual is 1 over n, then the probability that one of these i individuals takes over is going to be i over n. Okay. All right. Okay. But now, okay. Now you want to you want to allow for recombination, is that? I mean, yeah. Okay. Um, right. Okay. So yeah. So I mean, there, there are several important aspects of sex, right? Um, and and but you know, one of the major ones is is the recombination. And and so if you have enough recombination, then everybody will contribute. You know, well, everybody. Um, you know, then then there will be then there will be many uh, many individuals will contribute to the uh, to the lineage. What you often will here, people talk about is the ancestral Adam and the ancestral Eve, right? Uh, and that and 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 what are people referring to about that? Yes, in the back. Yes, right. Okay, so right. So there's there's this idea. Okay, so I don't want to get too much into the sexual sexually reproducing populations because that's covered more in other classes and it, it's a different, totally different models you would typically use. But um, I think that the simplest way to think about some of this is just that um, that there there's some part of the genome that does not have recombination in the same way. So it's simpler. What part of the genome is that in us? Right. So the Y chromosome. Right, and that, that means that in principle you can track the dynamics um, along uh, along the male lineages, right? You know, so there are all these studies, you know, whatever Genghis Khan, maybe lots of us are descendants of, right? Because he had lots of wives or something like that, right? So you know, so his Y chromosome is supposedly occupies like a non-negligible fraction of the population, right? Um, okay, so uh, but then what about what's the other? Um, yeah, so for, and on on the female side, what would be the equivalent? The mitochondria, right? So in principle, you can. Um, so I, I think for an awful lot of these studies, you can. Um, the, the the genetics are much simpler for the for um, for the for those two lineages because you don't have the recombination. Okay. So why is the mitochondria? Like I mean, you say it as it's like the most obvious thing. Okay. Yeah. Or, it's just like I've never heard that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Right. I so mean, we don't have to. Okay. Well. You're right. Okay. So so ba okay. Basically, the situation is that um, right. 
you know, we have cells, and, and most, of the, most of the genome is in the nucleus, right? Uh, but then, uh, but the mitochondria actually have their own uh, mitochondrial DNA, okay? Um, right, and then, and then the, the um, right, the issue is, okay, well, what happens, you know, okay, here's the birds and the bees talk for you guys, all right, so, <laughs> all right, so, right, um, right, so the sperm comes, fertilizes the egg, and the, so, the vast majority of the mitochondria uh, come from, or were in the egg, uh, as compared to mitochondria from the sperm. And I don't, do you, does anybody know if, there, if any of the sperm mitochondria actually contribute, they, is, are they selectively, does something happen to them? Oh, they just don't have any. Oh, all right, whew. All right, well, um, okay. <laughs> that, um, how, you know, uh, okay, well, that, that solves that problem. Okay. Uh, is that not true? Okay. All right. Well, I. Um, all right. This is the kind of thing that you know. Some somebody can maybe Wikipedia this while we're uh, while we're going. All right. Um, right. But that's that's the basic idea, though. Okay. All right. Does anybody have any questions about these two statements? Probability that A fixes. Probability that B fixes. Incidentally, you should be able to draw, OK, these are, these are random. All right, from this point moving forward, am I more likely, OK, so I'm, given where i is here, am I more likely to fix b or a? Ready, three, two, one, b. Does that mean that my first step is more likely to be in the direction of b than in a? Yes or no? Ready, three, two, one, no. no. OK, so this is a random walk. All right, it doesn't always take steps, but sometimes it goes up and then down. Da, da, da. All right, so it's gonna. Okay, I'm, now I'm, I'm, you know, I, you know, I understand it's not to, you know, whatever. Okay, so okay. Um, all right, but the idea is that once it, once it hits zero or one here in terms of the fraction, then you stay where you are. These are absorbing boundaries. But every now and then, it's going to hit. Okay. Uh, all right, before we get going too much more on this, I want to uh, mention something about time in this model, because time is a little bit of a funny, um, of a funny entity here. Okay. Um, all right, so here's a question. How long, OK, and long is funny, but how long does uh, one and I don't know. Do we want to call this an iteration or a cycle? Well, an iteration of the model? Um, right. And what I mean by that is that in, in, in units of something that would be like real time. You know what I mean? Is it a second, a generation time? So this would be like a cell generation time. Don't know something. Okay, let's. I'll give you 15 seconds. Can you can you guys all read this? Seconds, generation time, n times generation time, or one over n times generation time. Yeah. Well, let's say that I. I mean, let's just imagine that I was using this to model the dynamics of. I don't know the neutral drift dynamics of some bacteria in my test tube in the lab, right? So let's say I have one of these turbidostats, right? So I, the question is, how long does this last in, you know, in the units of, right? So how, how or equivalently, how many iterations do I have to go to get through some period of time in the lab, right? Okay, so I grow my bacteria in my turbidostat, say, uh, and I do it for 100 hours, okay? Now uh, your, your, your advisor says, okay, go, go do a simul, you know, so you get something, right? You know, and your advisor goes and says, all right, do a simulation. Use the Moran process. You know, you guys are going to be doing this, so this is not entirely hypothetical. Okay, but, um, right, so, so, you know, but whatever. Your advisor says, you're, um, you know, go, go simulate this process, 
right? So the question is, how many iterations would you, do you have to do to make it equivalent to that 100 hours that you did in the lab, right? How, 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 do, you, how do you make a connection between a model, this, well, this model, and, and something that actually happens in your, in your laboratory? All right, ready, three, two, one. OK, all right, so we got a majority of the group agreeing that it's going to be D. All right, can somebody just say why this is? Right, so each iteration, there's only one cell out of the N that actually divide, right? Uh, and that means that if you want, like for example, everybody to have had a chance, roughly, to divide, you need to go n iterations. Uh, and you know, and it also makes sense. You know, if you ask, let's imagine you have a, um, a test tube with, you know, a million bacteria. Okay. Now it's going to take some time before one of them divides. Right. Now the question is, if you had 10 million bacteria in your test tube, you're, you have to wait one tenth as long before the first one divides. Right. So the, the amount of kind of real time that elapses in each one of these iterations goes as 1 over n, where n is the population size. Okay. All right, so I, I got some um, unhappy looks. So that means that I expect an unhappy question, maybe. OK, well, if you don't ask a question, then you know, in the teaching evaluations, you're not allowed to write that you did not like the explanation of time in the Moran process. <laughs> All right. Well, that worked a little bit too well. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, so, an iteration is when one uh, cell or thing reduces. Yeah. Right. OK, an iteration in this model is, is, is both of these things, right? So it's a birth and a death or a replacement. Right? So, that's, so it's one duration here, another, you know. So each iteration involves one birth and one replacement. Right, so the generation time is the typical time that it takes for one of these individuals to give birth to another individual. Right, so in the case of the cells, it might be half an hour. Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm going to try to leave this up just so that you guys can continue to look at it. Um, all right, maybe I'll. So I, I want to say just something about this idea of a molecular clock while we're, um, while we're here. Um, okay. um, all right, so now that we've said something about how much time is actually elapsing here, um, we, can, we can think a little bit about the, the rate now we want to we want to allow mutations, okay? So let's assume that there's a uh, mutation rate or prob probability. So mu is the is the uh, probability of um, of a mutation, and we're going to say this is a neutral mutation, um, and this is per uh, per division or per birth. All right, so the idea is that when, all right, so we, we, we might start out with just all A individuals in the population. Okay. But then an A individual will give, okay, here's the mother cell, like the original A, that, and the mother cell, we're, for now, we'll just assume just doesn't um, ever mutate, but that the daughter cell has a probability mu of being a new type, say B. Okay. Um, and we often talk, call this a mutation rate. Okay, but it's a probability per, uh, per birth. Okay. All, right. Um, all right, so what we want to know is what is the, um, what we want to calculate is what's the, uh, the rate at which new uh, neutral mutants both appear and then fix in the population. Okay. So what we're asking about is from the standpoint of um, you know, us as, as scientists, we do sequencing of different lineages, say humans and chimpanzees, and we're looking at the accumulation of these what we think are neutral mutations. 
The question is, how many neutral mutations do we expect to see? Okay. So we need to know the rate that these things happen. Okay. So all right. So and and there there. Um, so this is the rate of of kind of fixation of neutral mutations. Uh, and so this is somehow the rate of neutral evolution. Right, there are two, two steps in here. What, what, what are the two things that have to happen? It right, needs to appear. So we'll, we'll call this the rate of appearance. And then what, what else do we need to know? I'm sorry, what's that? Right, so the population size, and, and why, why are you saying that? Or what's, uh, I mean, I, the population size is certainly going to be relevant. But I, I, um, I guess the question is, will the, will the rate of neutral evol evolution, you know, the, the, the rate at which you see new neutral mutants you know, in, in a lineage, will that be just equal to this? Or do we need to multiply it by something else? Yeah. Right, and, and, and it, it's a rate of fixation. And we'll say it's really kind of maybe a probability of fixation, right? Because there's some rate per unit time, maybe even like real time in terms of number of generations and real time. And, but we need to know the probability that it fixes, OK? OK. Great. All right, so uh, yeah, so let's, uh, all right, we're going to do, do a very detailed calculation here. Uh, yes? That's right. Could take a very long time. That's right. That's right. So, so for, for now, let, let's just assume that um, that the the rate of appearance of these is um, is small, so that you don't have to worry about n different mutants uh, competing against each other. We're not. We're going to spend a lot a lot of time on Thursday talking about this phenomenon of clonal interference when multiple mutant lineages are coexisting and perhaps competing in a population. But for simplicity for now, what we're just going to assume is that, um, that uh, there's a separation of time scales, right? which means that um, the rate at which these neutral mutants appear in the population is um, very small compared to the, um, the one over the time that it takes for the, the, uh, fixa you know, the fixation to occur. Okay. So what we want is, what's the rate of appearance here in units of like a real time. Okay. What are the fat, what are the things that are going to appear here? All right. The rate of mutation mu times population size. All right. And that's just because a larger population uh, will experience a larger rate of these mutants appearing in the population, and it's a linear. Right? OK, and that's actually just, that, that is indeed the rate of appearance. And the probability of fixation of each one. Excuse me, but it doesn't have the unit of rate. Oh, um, yes, OK, so, so this is, um, OK, so we have to actually. Per times, is that per yeah, generation? Yeah, so this is per, this is per, so this is a rate kind of per generation. Okay, so I guess I defined u, mu as the probability. Um, yeah, so this is all in units of per generation, basically, right? Because because mu is a per, right? Generation or iteration? Okay, let's make sure that I um, mu. This is a this is a generation, um, right? Because if um, if we have 10, right, so let's say that, for example, there's 10 to the 6 individuals here, and the mutation rate is, yeah. All right, probability fixation was what? 1 over n. One over n. Okay. Right, so this is great, because this is saying that the, um, the rate at which you expect neutral muta mutants to actually kind of appear in the population in terms of like, in terms of fixing, if you were to sequence along a lineage, uh, that it is independent of the population size, and is given given by the um, 
by the, 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 the rate of, of mutation. Okay. But what you expect, it, it's on a, it should be on a per generation basis. Okay. Uh, right, so this thing is, is perhaps useful in, in several different ways. Um, and and you know, there, there are some subtleties, like always, to this. Um, if you go out and you measure the rates of, of fixation of neutral mutants, what you find is that it's not really constant on a per generation basis, but more of on a, even, maybe even closer on a per actual like year basis, say. You know, uh, in particular, if the, the, this would predict that if, if organisms have the same uh, mutation rate, all right, you know, I'd say roughly maybe humans and mice. Okay? But yet humans and mice have very different generation times. Right, by two orders of magnitude, I don't know what, right? then you would expect the, the rate of accumulation of neutral mutants in the human population on a per year basis to be much lower than mice. Okay? But that's not true. Okay? We'll get into uh, a bit later of why that might be, but I just want to uh, highlight that, that's, that's, uh, that this model is very simple, and it predicts something that is you know, you know, too simple, maybe. But, but at least it's saying that there, there's some sense in which the population size is not as relevant as you might have thought it was going to be. Okay? And at least within a particular lineage, if you're talking about the accumulation of neutral mutations along humans, for example, then you can say maybe that's roughly constant. All right? it, gets very, it gets very tricky. I mean, if you look at the rate of accumulation of neutral mutants in one protein in humans, it's at a different rate than another protein in humans. All right, so you know, everything's complicated, but at least each one, along each of these proteins, maybe it still is roughly some sort of clock because it, it accumulates um, mutations at some rate that's, rough, you know, that's roughly linear with time. Okay. Of course, it's hard to imagine how any process like this can not go with time like that. But, um, but at least this is, this is potentially a, a useful thing. And in, indeed, when, when you read about studies of, from, from sequences trying to estimate uh, the time since the last common ancestor, um, this is... This is uh, the category of technique that is, is, I mean, this is the basis for that, is that you're just counting up um, how many neutral mutations appeared along these, along these different lineages. Okay. Um, and, and I think that there are, there are a number of really fascinating things that you can try to address with this kind of, uh, this kind of molecular clock. And I'll, I'll maybe bring up one of them. Just incidentally, you know, I, I'm not a huge fan of memorizing things, um, but for both size scales and time scales and so forth, I really very much do like the idea of everybody having memorized a few kind of signposts. Because okay? that way, when you hear something new, you have some way of interpreting whether it's big or small or something else. Right? So for example, uh, the, the, the time since uh, the last common ancestor between humans and chimpanzees, does anybody have uh, any sense of well, maybe I'll actually have us vote because I think it's useful in case you're off by, you know, many orders of magnitude that you, you know, you know, you you make. Okay, so it's the last common ancestor, human, chimpanzee, um, and incidentally, this is this is something that people do argue a lot about, but you know, it's it's within a factor of two, okay, of, of something, right? Okay, so I'm I'm going to go ahead and and make some. Um, all right, so hold on, I just want to make sure I get my. Um, Okay, well, it's seven times ten to six. All right. Um, All right, I'll give you uh, 10 seconds to orient yourself relative to other things you might know about the world. Um, OK, ready? Three, two, one. All right, we got. That's interesting. Um, OK, yeah, so I, I would say it's, it's kind of uniformly distributed. Oh. Almost. It's pretty uniform. Okay, there, there, are, there are a minority of, not very many E's, but I would say that uh, the other things are, are, are pretty, you know, I mean, you know, it's maybe peaked around here. Okay, so, um, all right, you know, I, I don't want to get into any biblical debates here, all right, but, um, 
Yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, right. Okay. So yeah. So what are some things that you know, you know if, if we have a timeline of the world? Okay. This is going to be a flash course in. All right. Okay. Here's. All right. Here I am. Okay. And I'm I'm unhappy because we don't know when humans and chimps. Um, all right. Okay. So this is us. All right. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. So let's say. Okay. So this we, we can start with. We're gonna start with Earth. Okay. All right. Okay. Four and a half billion. Okay. This might be on a logarithmic scale somehow. Okay. So we you know we're gonna just to space things out a little bit. Okay. But right. You know I don't know. Universe is what thirteen-ish billion years. I you know I, I don't know. Okay. People are calculating what these you know. Right. Thirteen billion. Four and a half billion. You know. Earth congeals. You know it's hot. You know whatever. Um, all right, so life gets started maybe a, you know a billion years later, right? Okay. Three point nine. Three sounds like a fine number. What, what, <laughs> wait, what did you vote for, human and chimpanzee? You know, you're very specific on this one. <laughs> I, uh, I actually vote for three point five times. The okay, all right. So you're okay. Yeah, no. And, okay, you want to get involved in this actual debate? Okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, all right, no, but okay. I just want to. Um, I, uh, all right, so I, yeah. Now I'm I'm going to be stuck between the linear and the logarithmic scaling of how I want to. All right, I, I, this is going to be some sort of funny logarithmic scaling from here to here, right? Okay, so dinosaurs, right, 60 some million years ago, right? So say bye to the dinosaurs, okay? Dinosaurs, um, 60, right? Okay. Cambrian explosion was before that. Yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, is that? Okay, it's. Uh, okay, all right, okay, so yeah, okay, so, um, all right, so this is around human chimp. And indeed, people argue about whether it's 5 or 10. But, you know, given that we were uniformly distributed across this number, we shouldn't pick the, you know, be nitpicky about the left one, right? Um, Right. Okay. And you know, agriculture, you know, was maybe twelve thousand years ago. Just to, you know, okay, some sense of things. All right. Um, yeah, human and Neanderthals. Right. That's you know, uh, okay, seventy. Okay, that's a yeah. This is when this is right. Oh, common ancestor was before, but in terms of interbreeding, was you know. All right. So this was the you know interbreeding. If you want to read that paper. Okay. All right. I. Um, all right. But human chimp is is here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, around seven million years. Okay. And, you know, I, and it's not that this is the number that's magical that you have to memorize, but I think that you you should have some event in the history of the world, kind of at each logarithmic spa spacing, just so that you, you know, that way when you when you hear about when something happened, you know kind of vaguely where to put you know where to put something, right? Um, Otherwise, it just doesn't mean anything, right? Okay. All right. Um, one of my favorite examples of how, how the molecular clock was used to come up with something um, that I think is, is pretty neat and non-trivial is to try to answer this question of when humans started wearing clothing. Okay. So this is um, a priori not very obvious, right? Because we know, we know that we have, we have evidence for clothing as you know, maybe 30,000 years ago. Right, that there are, there are needles that were used for clothing. Uh, there were, uh, and, you know, and, and some of these little figurines, you know, at least some fraction of the, you know, the figurines, like fertility goddess kind of thing, some fraction of them have some clothing, right? So then, you know, okay, that means it suggests that there, was, there were clothes there, right? But the question is, be, before that, it's actually rather difficult to know um, when, when we started wearing clothes, right? Um, apparently, uh, we lost. Uh, our, our body hair, something like a million years ago. So you might say, oh, maybe that's around when we started uh, wearing clothes. Of course, a lot of you know, animal hide and so forth wouldn't, uh, wouldn't last. So there wouldn't, there's not any archaeological evidence of this. Okay. All right, so uh, do, is anybody aware of, of uh, how uh, researchers have used the molecular clock ideas in order to try to answer this question? Okay. 
Yeah. Yeah, this, this is amazing. Okay, all right, so, um, all right, so it's, it's, you, use, you use lice. Um, there have been a number of studies doing this, um, and, and apparently there was, a, there was a researcher in Germany who, who was at you know, the Max Planck Institute for genomi you know, genomics or something, and he, uh, his son came home with a note uh, saying, and it, actually this happened to me recently, that he got an email that, you know, there's a lice outbreak and, you know, the stay out of preschool, so watch out when you're going by the play area. All right, so, um, all right, so, so yeah, so he got, he got this note back from his, his, you know, his son's preschool that said, oh, yeah, you know, there's a lice outbreak, so this is what you have to watch out for. And, but it, it said, oh, there's a, there's a different species of lice that um, inhabits our clothing as our hair. Okay? All right, so, you know, you know I'd say this is one of those things that, you could just read that and say, oh, well, whatever, right? Or if you're a geneticist, you read that and you say, oh, I can use this to figure out <laughs> you know, when humans started wearing clothes, right? Because presumably the, uh, the, the species that, uh, that specializes in living um, in our clothing was probably not there or had not yet speciated uh, at, uh, before we had clothes. Of course, you, know, you can imagine ways that this could fail, but it's a neat, uh, it's a neat hypothesis. Right? So then you can go and you can uh, basically sequence uh, the species of lice that, uh, it, that lives in our clothing as compared to the kind that lives in our hair. And you can ask how many neutral mutations accumulated um, along these different lineages. Okay? Now, you can imagine that you know, based on, since we just did this very nice study, um, we know that it should, you know, it should be more than 30,000 years and it should be less than 7 million probably, hopefully. Although, you know, it's always possible that our ancestral state was wearing clothes and that the chimpanzees stopped wearing clothes. Um, but, pro you know, but we'd be surprised if that were the case, right? Um, all right, so, in, and indeed, um, all right, so this is, this is basically just asking about, um, you know, head lice versus uh, clothing lice, clothes lice. And, and the, the original study by this uh, researcher, Max Planck, estimated 70,000 years. But then there, just a couple of years ago, there was another uh, publication from a professor at the University of Florida that estimated 170,000, right? So, you know, it's not, there still is a fair range. But I guess the most recent estimate you would, we'd have to say is 170,000. Okay. Which, um, which is neat, right? I mean, I don't know. It, it's not that it changes necessarily how I go about my daily life. Uh, but... Uh, um, but I really love this idea that, um, that, you know, it's a very basic question that, you know, your toddler son might ask you. Something that you'd think that would be just, might be totally unknowable, right? In the sense that we would never have any way of getting at least any estimate at all, right? But, you know, using kind of some clever, you know, th you know theoretical ideas together with experimental or, you know, data on, uh, this, you know, this accumulation of neutral mutations allows one to at least make a ballpark estimate of, um, of something that there's no physical record of except, uh, except in the DNA of our louses. Is that a word? Is it? Uh, it's just lice. It's just lice, all right. <laughs> yeah. All right, well. Um, all right, any, any questions about, about this one, this point? All right, so this is, this is all uh, neutral mutation, but of course uh, we'd like to you know, move beyond these neutral mutations to try to understand how, um, how non-neutral mutations spread. Okay? I'm not going to do the derivation because uh, the derivation is in your book and you just read about it, but um, I do want to just make sure that we understand what this equation is telling us. Okay? All right, so first of all, what we're going to assume is that, um, that A has some relative fitness uh, R. So R is defined as basically the relative fitness of A, or you know, the fitness of A divided by the, rel the fitness of B. Okay? So R is greater than 1 means that A is advantageous. Less than 1 means, means that it's uh, deleterious. Okay? And what we're told is that X sub I, which is the uh, probability that A fixes, is equal to this expression. Okay. Right. A, okay, A fixes given uh, 
given i a individuals and n minus i b individuals. That's right. That's right. The, the assumption is that replacement is, is unbiased, purely random, and it's only, it's only birth that is different by a factor of r. Okay. And so I think that this is, on one level, wonderful. Right? It's kind of a simple expression describing a lot of information of the dynamics of this stochastic process. Okay. Um, on another level, the problem is that you look at it, and I think it's easy to have like absolutely zero intuition for what this thing does. Right? Um, so what I always like to do when I first, you know, when, when a student comes to my office and says, oh, I derived something great for our project, you, know, you take a few limits to see, just get, get a sense of what's going on with it. Um, you know, half the time, you find that it's not true. Okay? But, um, but at least it's a way of, of developing intuition for, uh, for what's happening. Right, so what are, what are limits that this thing should behave? You know? Should it be zero if there's no uh, intermediate that you can do? OK. All right, so x, x of 0 should be equal to, uh, to 0 is what you're saying. Right? If you have 0 a individuals, you should have 0 probability of fixing independent of your fitness. Right? Um, all right, that sounds like a reasonable thing to check. <laughs> right, uh, and it, it, does, it, it, does it work? Right. So r to the 0 is equal to 1. So that's 1. So it's 1 minus 1, 0. Yep. Yes? r goes to infinity independently of what you start with except 0, then you expect uh, a to fix. That's right. So the limit of xi for any i other than 0, as r goes to infinity, right, this should be equal to 1. Okay. Um, all right, so let's see. If r goes to infinity, we get 0. zero oh, this is r. Oh, yeah, this is also 0. 1 divided by 1 is equal to 1. All right. Does everybody agree with that? Okay. Other things that you know, right? So and that makes sense. Just that you know, if um, if A is just super super fit, then it should fix, right? No. Okay. Um, and of course, what's tricky here is that R has to be surprisingly large before this thing ends up being true. So you know, so we have to be um, this 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 limit is great and it's correct and true, but it's also a little bit dangerous because. Um, well, well, we'll see that you know, even things that you think of as being very beneficial mutations typically uh, do not fix. Right? So this is, um, this is the danger, but at least um, but the limit is still true. Okay. Okay, any, any other limits that we think ought to, ought to happen? When i goes to n. When i goes to n. OK, right. So and indeed, if, 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 and this is the opposite of this one. This is just saying that if, if you already have fixed, then you fixed. Right. And indeed, if i is equal to n, then okay, that works. Right. Uh, any other limits that you believe should be true, think should be true? The one we already checked for i for r equals one. Yes. All right. So indeed. So if 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 it's neutral, so the limit as r goes to one of x i should be equal to what? Should be equal to i over n. Okay. Um, all right. So this one is a little bit less obvious, right? Because if you if you set r equal to uh, one, right? Does that mean we? It, does this mean that it's equal to zero? All right. And what's the problem? Well, okay. But I think you have to be careful. Even that statement's not true. It's not even necessarily close to zero. Wait, right, this is the L'Hopital's rule. Didn't, in, there, there was another context already where L'Hopital came up, right? Maybe? OK, right, so the problem is that if you set r equal to 1 here, then you get 0. So then you'd think, oh, the answer is 0. But you have to be more careful than that, because this also is equal to 0, right? So, uh, you know, and so L'Hopital's, you know, um, L, H, 
Or is, is, the, is it up of the H? Is it good? Yeah. All right. OK, all right. You're, you're French, right? Or I mean, uh, you know, sort of. OK. All right. All right. He's from Quebec. So I, I don't know what, uh, what that question will, how it's interpreted. All right. Um, OK, so, right, so the, the, for L'Hopital, right, so you, what you just have to do is then um, you take the derivative with respect to r for both the numerator and the denominator, and then you see what happens. And then you, but you take the limit again. And sometimes you have to take, you have to apply L'Hopital's rule multiple times, right? So what we have, what we write here is this is the limit as r goes to one, and we take the derivative of the numerator with respect to r. So we get out an i one over r to the i plus, oops, i plus one maybe. Uh, and here we get out an n right. right so we took the derivative with respect to r here and the derivative with respect to r you know but we left it as a limit because we might need to apply it again right just cuz after you take the derivative you're not guaranteed that it's going to work out fine but in this case it does right because already this limit we can, we're allowed to just set it equal to 1 because nothing blows up right so this is indeed equal to i, to I over n Um, and, and the important point here is that it's not necessarily approximately equal to, to 0, right? It could be anywhere between 0 and 1, depending on what i and n are. Okay. All right, so, uh, right, so that means that this expression here uh, captures the dynamics uh, actually for all i, r, n within the Moran process. Right? So this thing is, uh, is simply uh, just true in this model. Okay, there are no, no approximations yet. Okay. Uh, there is, however, one uh, approximation that is very, uh, very useful to make, which is uh, the approximation of what, um, what happens when r is, um, is approximately 1. Okay. In particular, what we're going to ask is um, if we define something called a selection coefficient that is 1 plus s. The idea here is that in many cases, I mean, we're going we're gonna, to, well, for Thursday, we're going to read a paper that, uh, that I think is, is quite interesting. And where they were analyzing the, um, the, the, the appearance of these mutations that would uh, allow bacteria to survive in some environment and do better. Right? And, and typical selection coefficients here are kind of 1, 2, 3 percent. Right? So uh, the mutations that appear and that allow an, one of these cells to do better in this new environment Convert an advantage that were that was on the order of a percent or two or so, right? Which means that S here would be like 0 0.01, 0 0.02, right? Which means that for basically this, all the situations that you see in the laboratory and so forth, what you really want to know is what happens for small s, right? So for s uh, much less than one, so for where r is approximately equal to one. Right, um, you know, and in this case, we can say, all right, x i, well, and ah, and we actually are going to want to ask about x sub one. All right, so all right, that's a one now. All right, uh, okay, and and the reason for that is that we want to know, right, there's some rate that uh, new mutations will appear in the population. When they appear, they'll be present in a single individual, and we want to know what is the probability that, that one individual let's say has a that's a beneficial mutation well the probability that it'll fix okay so what we want to know is for s um, much less than one but larger than zero all right so for it's a beneficial mutation of modest effect what's the probability that will fix right well the idea here is that r to the n is going to be uh, it's going to be much larger than uh, one, just because n is often a big population. Okay. Now, in that situation, th we, this is just approximately equal to one over one over r. Okay. And uh, 
r, we've already decided, can be expressed as 1 plus the selection coefficient. Okay. Now, um, this is something that you want to be able to simplify uh, in your sleep. Okay. 1 divided by 1 plus s is approximately equal to 1 minus 1 minus s. Okay. And uh, this is indeed uh, approximately equal to s. So this is saying that in the Moran process, if a beneficial mutation appears in the population with selection co coefficient s that might be 1, 2, 3 percent, then it has a 1, 2, 3 percent probability of surviving. Okay. Because here, this is, the, you know, this is the probability of fixing. But in this situation, fixation and survival are the same thing because we're just considering this one mutation. Right, so if the only thing that we're considering is this, the fate of this one mutation in the population, we're going to assume for now that you can't get new mutations in the population to compete with. Right, then either you go extinct or you take over the population. Okay? And what's surprising here is that even a fitness effect that's, you know, that you think of as big, like 3 4%, right? that's, I would love to get such a mutation. All right? But still in a uh, population in the Moran process, or really in any other uh, model like this, uh, it will typically go extinct. Okay. Now, it's, it's worth saying that uh, depending upon the model that you're using, uh, you'll get different numbers in here. Okay. Right. In this case, the probability of uh, fixation or survival is, is you know, 1 times s. But in some other models, uh, it depends on the branching process. It could be 2 times s. Or, you know, but it's something of order unity times s. Right. OK, so this, right. Uh, one over n. OK, exactly. This must assume that s is much, much greater than 1 over n. Exactly. All right, so what we've, what we've assumed is that, um, that this is true. And, and that, I think, already actually, I think that's actually already sufficient. Right? Um, and indeed, it, you, know, you can go and you can do the, um, you can do the expansion that, uh, and find what x sub 1 should be equal to. In, in general here, and um, for, for, small, for small s, but um, inclu including you know, the possibility that it's very, you know, I'm sorry, for, for small s, but not super small s, right? You know, it's a matter of what you're comparing to. Um, and, and you end up getting uh, 1 over n plus s over 2. Okay. Around, and this is, this is for, this is for uh, s times n um, much less than 1. Okay. All right. And indeed, this is the definition of what we mean by nearly neutral. Okay. Because you know, up to now, we've been talking about neutral mutations as if uh, they just had to be exactly, exactly neutral. But then really, uh, that probably doesn't actually literally exist, right? I mean, if, but if a, if a mutation appears and it only changes your fitness by one part in 10 to the minus 30, then it is equivalent to being a truly neutral mutation. Right? But the way that you quantify that is this thing, s times n. You want to know whether it's larger or smaller than 1. Okay. So if, for example, if you plot uh, x sub 1, as a function of s, 0, right? Uh, it crosses 1 over n here. Okay. Now, uh, it's going to have a slope here, s over 2, but then it kind of goes up. Uh, it eventually hits this. This is just the s line, right? Because if s is much less than 1, Yet s times n is much larger than 1, right? then x1 is approximately equal to s. Right? And then over here, this goes down uh, kind of exponentially. Right? But the statement is that if s times n is much less than 1, then uh, the mutation acts essentially as if it's neutral. Okay? So then you can just work with that. Uh, whereas if s times n is much larger than 1, then you end up, it's not guaranteed that it's going to fix. 
right? But it's it's much larger than a probability of one over n. Whereas down here, uh, it becomes uh, very unlikely to fix once s times n is is larger than one on the deleterious side. Okay. Are there any questions about what what's going on here? Yes. That's right. Um, yeah, so, uh, and, and indeed, when I did this calculation originally, I, I was very confused because I thought it should be that. But what you see is that if you plot this, the slope here, which is the half, is less than slope over here, which is 1. Well, what's funny is I actually spent like hours trying to figure out where, where I had made my mistake. So I, 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 no, but I think that if you just draw it, then it, it has to be, I think it's all consistent. Um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm plotting the entire curve analytically perfectly. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, but you know, it's just that the limit, I mean, right. I mean, it's just the, the, what we know is that it behaves like this around here and like S up here, and then I've just connected them. Is that I, it? Probably doesn't answer your question, yeah, but it, yeah. um, okay. Um, I so I think we, we have just enough time to say something about this Muller's ratchet idea. Okay. Um, all right. Verbally, can a deleterious mutation s less than zero can it fix in a population? Yes or no? Ready? Three, two, one. Yes. Yeah. All right. This is greater than zero. Right. Now it's very unlikely to fix if the magnitude of s times n is much larger than 1. Right? But for small size populations, you, know, you can actually fix relatively deleterious mutations. Right? So the idea is that uh, for small populations, there's going to be some, uh, it's easy to accumulate deleterious mutations. And indeed, this is related to um, something called a mutation accumulation assay. Right, so if you take a population of bacteria or other microorganism, uh, ac no, accum I don't know, accumulation. All right. All right, so you grow up your bacteria in a test tube, and so you have a bunch of bacteria. Right? So now there, there's selection acting in here, because the, the faster dividing cells are spreading. However, what you do is that you then plate, plate them in, as colonies. And these colonies each started as single cells. But then what you do is you just take a random cell, take a random colony right, that, that came from a single cell, and you grow it up here. Um, or you could just replay directly if you like. But, uh, and then you just repeat this process. Right? The idea is that here, this is, you, you've, you've picked a random cell from this population, and you allowed it to grow up. And so you've kind of removed the effects of selection in here. Okay. And so when you pick a random colony here, maybe that colony got some weird mutation that decreased its fitness, but it wasn't really selected against because you just kind of picked one of these colonies randomly. Right. So this kind of process is uh, a way of reducing what's known as the effective population size, and effective. Okay. All right, so when, uh, when populations are not constant in time, but instead oscillate or fluctuate, then um, in many cases, the, the dynamics or the strength of, of this drift or the stochastic stuff, that, that can be characterized by some and effective. And of course, depending on which variable or which quantity you're trying to study, you might have a slightly different and effective. But the point is that uh, if you have fluctuating population sizes, then um, the, the, pop the relevant population size for thinking about these sorts of ideas is often one is towards the smaller side of the, of the range of the fluctuating population. So you're kind of dominated by how, how small the bottleneck gets. Okay. And here, you're kind of going through a single cell bottleneck. So that leads to a very small and effective. And it allows for the accumulation of deleterious mutations. Okay. Now, we'll say something more about this Muller's ratchet idea. Because uh, in, this, in the field of evolution, I'd say one of the uh, one of the big overriding questions is trying to understand uh, the uh, evolutionary advantages of sexual reproduction. 
right? Because of this famous uh, twofold cost of sex, that you, it, it seems that an asexual population should be able to uh, to grow uh, twice as fast as a sexually re reproducing population, right? Because the males are not giving birth, right? So it's a huge cost associated with sexual reproduction. And the question is, why is it that so many uh, organisms engage in it? And one of the uh, ex uh, explanations that's been proposed is this Muller's ratchet idea, that uh, it may alleviate this accumulation of deleterious mutations. Right? We'll talk more about how this works out, maybe quantitatively, and the other proposals and so forth later. But, um, but you may, uh, over the course of your studies, come across this Muller's ratchet vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the question of sexual reproduction. So I just wanted you to know that there is this discussion out there about um, how sexual reproduction may uh, allow for the separation of these beneficial and deleterious mutations that would otherwise uh, accumulate in the population.